Go ahead and start, Kathleen. All right. Welcome, everybody. Hello. My name is Kathleen Salinas, and I'm the program manager of the Brentwood Arts Center. I thank you and welcome you to our virtual auditorium for BAC's Conversations on Art series with our host, Meg Linton, and our guest artist, Siri Carr. Our executive director, Amy Gantman, regrets that she can't be here today, but joins me in welcoming you. Brentwood Art Center's success is due to our incredible and generous board of directors, leadership council, donors, staff, faculty, and students who support the BAC through thick and thin. And I want to thank our anonymous donor who has made the Conversations on Art series possible for the next 12 months. We can only do all that we do because of our generous donors who believe everyone should have access to the arts and education. I'd like to be sure to mention <clears throat> that BAC's new campus in Santa Monica, located at 1625 Olympic Boulevard, is open and that our winter 2024 term will begin on January 9. The campus is very close to 18th Street, uh, excuse me, 18th Street Art Center, Crossroads School, and a Metro stop is nearby. We are excited to be offering in-person classes once again, so your support is more important than ever. Our host, Meg Glinton, and BAC Executive Director Amy Gantman met at Otis College of Art and Design while Meg was the Director of Exhibitions for the Ben Maltz Gallery, and Amy was the Dean of Continuing Education. The divisions collaborated on many public programs, and we are thrilled to bring Meg's love and respect for artists to the BAC. Meg has been visiting artist studios for over 20 years in her various roles as director and curator of contemporary art spaces in Southern California. Currently, Meg is lead producer on a documentary film about feminist performance art in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 1980s called Acting Like Women, directed by Sherry Galke. She is working on an exhibition about the artist Keith Julius Puccinelli that opens in September of 2024 at UC Santa Barbara, writing a novel, and of course, conversing with Siri Carr for the BAC this afternoon. Welcome, Meg. Thank you, Kathleen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the BAC and our anonymous donor and to everyone working behind the scenes who make this program possible. The, hol the holiday season has begun and we welcome you to Conversations on Art and our last virtual studio visit for the year is with Siri Carr. I want to share that we have given the we have been given the green light for 2024 and will return on February 2nd with the artist Deborah Ashheim. So I hope you'll join us in the new year. Before I introduce today's guest, I have the usual housekeeping. Um, we are recording today's presentation and we ask that you please mute your microphones and turn off your video. This helps to avoid any like static or feedback. Um, during the conversation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I'll either work them into the conversation or I'll make sure they get answered by the end of today's program. And in the chat box, you'll also find that we have put some additional information about our artists today so you can peruse that on your own time and there's also instructions on how to save that as a zoom file so you can refer to it later. So Siri Carr and I crossed paths um, at Otis, just like me and Amy Gantman. And I'd say Siri and I have been mutual fans of each other's work for, for years. Um, she has described herself as an artist and photographer who is interested in examining the identities that occupy dualities, diversity, and contradiction with an eye out for the photographic quality of magic. She teaches at UCLA and has a new book coming out in 2024 called Sister Moon. If any of you attended our talk with Amanda Yates Garcia, you've seen Siri's work as she did a beautiful photo shoot with the Oracle of LA. So we're gonna jump right into it. So please welcome Siri Carr. Hi, Meg. Hi, Thank you how are you? for having me. Yeah, we're so excited. So we're gonna just jump right in and start with the images and start talking. So here's you in your studio. So what are we seeing behind you? Is this like just a study wall or? Yes. So today I'm in my studio and I think it's always really interesting to see process and the mess behind, you know, the more finished bodies of work. Um, so behind me today uh, is a layout for my upcoming book. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So 
Um, I tend to print everything as little eight by tens. And then I use them as kind of cards that I shuffle around and uh, to sort of figure out relationships, see formal uh, qualities, to see the light, how they interact with each other, mm -hmm. how the images work. Um, so I use the wall and I kind of, I just move them around constantly. And, and I think about them out of the corner of my eye. I think about them when I walk in the room. Um, and it's, so it's sort of my, this is my active messy process behind me. That's fantastic. It's kind of like a writer with all their post-it notes, storylines. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it, you know, it's so tricky figuring out the scale, the, the sort of sequencing, all of those, um, different issues that go into the, the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, here in this picture that's up, um, you can see me with some larger scale works. Um, and so, you know, before this book, I've, I've been obsessed with books forever, but I had mostly come from the world of exhibitions. So thinking more about scale in terms of how images work on a gallery wall. Mm -hmm. um, like so that's, that's kind of what we're seeing in this image too, is you exactly. laying out a show or considering your exhibition options. Exactly, exactly. And thinking about scale, you know, in a show, thinking about your body in relationship to the varying scales, um, I tend to like to vary the scale because I think it kind of destabilizes the brain in a certain way that I find interesting. So like having very large works juxtaposed with smaller. Um, and then, you know, in a book, it's a different sort of animal, right? So it's, um, so for the wall behind me, I made everything exactly the same size, which is a very odd sort of way to do it for me. <laughs> yeah. But it probably helps you figure out like what spreads you want to have or single exactly. shot on one page. Yeah. Exactly. Sort of making them all the same and having starting from that sameness. Um, mm -hmm. This is a really just like messy. That's the other side of my studio. I just figured like just throw in some like if you actually came into my studio, you would see that messy yeah. side. So I thought I would just it's, throw it in there. Not as messy as a painter's studio. No. Um, but where is your studio? Are you, I, is, is it at home or is it? No, no, it is not at home. Thankfully. I, I don't think I would ever get anything done if it was at home. <laughs> Um, I have a studio in a building, it's called the Los Angeles Industrial Arts Compound, and it's on the LA River in oh, Glass. Nice. Yeah, so that's not far to go. Exactly. And I like it because there's all sorts of different um, makers in the building. So not everyone's a fine artist. There's welders and motorcycle refurbishers and all sorts of industrial um, makers here. Oh, that's excellent. So you get a um, nice variety. Yeah interesting yeah. people to talk to in the hallways. Exactly. Exactly. And if I need any welding done, I know where to go. <laughs> now for your book, who's publishing your book? The book is going to be published by Charcoal Press. Um, they're a publisher based out of Ohio and they have a book club. So it's called the Charcoal Book Club and they uh, send a book every month to their members. And the book that they send monthly is not necessarily published by them, but they do um, have their own imprint and they, they publish about two to three to four titles a year. Um, mm -hmm. Is it, and I, do you apply or is it kind of like an award process or? So they publish books that are not through the award process, but they do have an award that is um, the charcoal publishing prize that is given to one artist a year, which I won in 2021. That's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, wait, technically, yes. COVID sort of messed up the timeline. Right. But... <laughs> yes, it, it messed up the timeline for everyone. And I also know the printing industry has had horrible supply chain issues. So it's good that it's finally coming out. Yes, I'm very excited. I'm hoping that sort of the COVID years are behind us yeah. <laughs> and I'm regaining some of the momentum, but I, I did find the COVID years to be in retrospect, um, as difficult as they felt at the time, a period of wintering, um, for me where mm -hmm. it was this time of deep reflection where I, I really went into my archive and was able to consider all of the work that I've made over the past 30 years. Um, because I've been think. making work for 30 years. I started about exactly 30 years ago. So will this book be the breath of that or is it kind of a survey of your work or is it going to focus on specific bodies of work? It will be its own work. Oh, nice. 
Yes. However, it has pictures from a breadth of projects. Um, the central theme of the book are photographs of my sister. Um, one of my sisters is 14 years younger than me, and she is my muse. And I photographed her for 30 years. Oh, and, that's fantastic. and we'll yeah, see so some I, of those images later in the talk, right? Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. There's I threw in a few right at the end in the messy, in the messy depths. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so what are we looking at? Who are we looking at? So I started off when I put together the slideshow, I started off with sort of the beginnings of finished projects. Um and my first love was portraiture, just formal, actual portraiture. And it comes from, and as does all my work, from a deep longing to understand others. So what is it like to be in another body? Because we can never truly know that. So for me, my work is about exploring and attempting to reach out to other people and to other people's experiences. Hmm. So... This body of work, this image comes from a body of work called Cruiserweight, which is photographs of amateur wrestlers um, right after their matches. So I was very inspired by the work of Renee Dykstra and her 1990s beach photographs, um, where she photographed adolescents sort of in this in-between, dare I say, liminal state. Um, and so this work, it was very much about these sort of sculptural bodies at rest, um, right at the moment when they have been exhausted. And these works were made with a four by five, four by five camera. And so that's a, that's a very different process from say a 35 millimeter handheld work. Um, it just, they, they take on a different quality and the quality is a much more still and sculptural, um, formal luminosity, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, and you can see it because of the way that the camera works, you can't sort of photograph quickly. It's a slow process and the camera exists separately from the photographer. So it's, it's the photographer and then there's a the camera and then there's the subject. So it's a much slower work. So did you have method. To set everything up where you were going to be and then just direct them right after their match? I mean, what were, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very like there's um, some labor physical challenges there it was very physically demanding this work because I had a light as well that I would carry and I had no assistant so it was just me carrying a four by five on a tripod and a light um and I would just I would just you know I learned a lot doing this because I had to be so quick um I would just mm -hmm. light meter meter their face do the exposure I would usually get two shots and that was that. Yeah. Because they would also have to run off to their next match. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, they didn't have very much time. So, and, you know, this is from the year 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a different time. So people were still um, like, I don't even know that I would be allowed to make this work now. Possibly I would, right. but you know, these are high school students for the most part. So to get access, this kind of access, you know, I, there is like a certain like female privilege as well that I, that I had in making this work mm -hmm. because I come across as very non-threatening. Right. So, right. um, which I hope I am actually genuinely, but there was a sort of, um, way that I was able to move within this world, um, and get access to it. That was very unique to this time and place and also to me as well. Right. Cause things really have changed. With I think all they have. social media and the selfies and the social pressure that's being conveyed through that, those platforms. Yeah. Like, I don't think those teenagers were as self-conscious in sort of constructing their images as they would be today. And then this body of work got received a lot of attention. Yes. Yeah, so this body of work is um, you know, playing a lot more with constructed self. So these people in these, in the images, um, they're very much in control of their own image in control of the way that they come across. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a very constructed self. 
And I was fascinated by this, you know, as a sort of challenge, because it's hard to photograph someone who has a very constructed self. So I think, you know, today, someone who's like an influencer, who's very, um, you know, used to how they come across in a photograph, that would be a sort of equivalent because the impersonators were very much, you know, they, they were just, they're so dead. They were so dedicated to performing this right. role. So I was always in, interested in finding the schism, this like moment where they cracked. Um, because I think that that's fascinating. I think it's so fascinating the way that we perform everyday life and sort of thinking about that for people who have a role like this. So when you say when they crack, is it, do you mean like the guy, the Superman sitting on the telephone, this kind of intimate moments when they're Yes. Like he, like the Superman on the phone, he's letting his guard down a bit. Right. right. So he's, he's in his costume he, and actually that's in his house. Right. So his house was this very dedicated Superman space, right? Like very obsessive. And then the, I think that the reason people love this photograph so much is because it's a casual gesture, right? So it's, it's this setup costume. Assumed. And, you know, he's pretty amazing. He looks like Christopher Reeve. So he's this yeah. <laughs> man who's imitating a movie star, imitating a comic book, but then at rest. So it's right. this sort of way that we, when we see him letting up his guard and sort of the casual gesture of the phone and the hand, I think that that's sort of where um, the magic happens in that picture. Yeah. And then did they, did any of the them, try to kind of control how you were going to be photographing them like were they or did yes. they give tips or yes yes okay <laughs> they they were very very it depended on the person superman his name was christopher dennis was less so because he just that was just his personality he was very gentle right a very gentle and sort of self-effacing man, which is funny to think about someone who's a professional impersonator. Um, but that's how he was. But so it depended on the person. Some of them were a lot more than others. And it was always interesting to see who was more controlling. Um, yeah. That Dana, who's the Wonder Woman, was also, I mean, honestly, for the most part, they were such lovely people. Yeah. Um, because I tend not to get good photos of people I don't like. So... <laughs> Although occasionally there's a tension there, right? That works yeah. if, if I don't necessarily like them, but I like almost everyone I photograph. So um, Dana, the Wonder Woman was just, she was so lovely. And it's so funny because people think that's me always. They always think well, it's me. You do have a Wonder Woman vibe. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, you know, she's, I'm, you know, in real life, I'm 5'11 and she's 5'1 or something, you know, like it's so funny how <laughs> photographs operate, like, because I, I'm the photographer. So people think that's me. It's like this funny, um, sort of layer added. Um, so this is the book, um, that I made a, about this project It's called this kind of face. And the title comes from a quote by the Jack Nicholson impersonator that I photographed for the book. Mm -hmm. Um, where he says, only in America could I be successful with this kind of face. Nice. <laughs> and so the, the book includes all sorts of different people with alter egos. Um, so on the left, you see a Lincoln impersonator who's, you know, impersonating someone who's dead, who's, who's mm -hmm. long dead, who's a, has an, a, a historical figure. And then on the right, you have Snow White, who's... A, you know, a, a fairy tale character. Right. Um, and sort of mixing them together and mixing together the formal qualities of the works. So some are closer up, some are sort of more stage formal portraiture, some are more, um, you know, what we would call now post-documentary. So there's, it, it's, it seems like there's some sort of truth in the, in the images, right? Mm -hmm. So always thinking about this, this idea of truth, what is true in images, nothing really, but then cameras are these machines that record the world. So there's some truth in the sense of they're recording the light, they're recording in some way what actually did happen. So it's like this tension of the camera machine and truth is always interesting to me.
this shot is, yeah he does look a lot like christopher reeves <laughs> yeah he's really very handsome very he was an amazing amazing impersonator so how did you approach them did you just approach them on the street and then befriend them because i'm sure they so i uh met christopher um who's the superman here first uh i met him the first week that i moved to los angeles actually um i was walking down the street and he started talking to me and he was like had a very sort of he's this very tall imposing man but he was very gentle and self-effacing and he told me he he wanted to give me advice which is that I could make money dressing as Wonder Woman and I was like yeah you're right that's a great idea <laughs> um so and then I and then I thought oh he'd be a great photo subject so we sort of struck up a friendship nice yeah and then I actually um I did get a Wonder Woman costume eventually and <laughs> would occasionally stand with them um but I so I sort of embedded myself and then I met people through him um so he was sort of my entree into the impersonator society because I'm sure there is a little fear that you're gonna make fun of them yeah yeah, yeah. and I never want to make fun of them they can be funny yes of course right. so it's a fine line right like work that's funny is hard I think mm -hmm. Um, so they, they can be funny. Like the share is funny. There's something funny about her, but she's also amazing. Right. You know, it's also like sometimes what they're impersonating is not visible in the photo. So like a singer, what they're actually like, one of the tools that they use for the impersonation isn't in the picture. So it's this sort of, um, you know, like she would be singing, she would be using right. her voice to impersonate share as part of it. Um, so I, the act, part of the act isn't there as well. Um, and then this, these Marilyn's, this shoot that I did of five of them together, um, I wanted it to just be this endless, um, iconic repetition of signifiers, right? So like mm -hmm. the wig, the dress, um, and we immediately recognize them as Marilyn, um, right. These are actually mother and daughter as well. The the woman lying on the couch and then the the lady behind her, their mother and daughter. Oh. Yeah. Which I thought so it's sort That's of an interesting dynamic. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, the mother just showed up and I was like, why don't you dress up too? Well, that's cool. Yeah, it was great. Oh, and this is what you're talking about in terms of scale. Exactly. So that's an installation view of a show I did at Cohen Gallery in Los Angeles um, of this kind of face um, where there's sort of like that juxtaposition um, where you can see there are different kinds of photos, right? So the Marilyn is, is a black and white and it's um, sort of catching this pose in the middle of this pose, right? Like using the vocabulary of a glamour shot in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to make that one bigger so that you can see her eye and see the sort of gesture really close. Um, and then juxtapose with the Superman that's a far, you know, composed farther away, but is a bit smaller. They're both intimate in very different ways. Exactly. So sort of like they compare and contrast with each other is my mm -hmm. hope. Um, and I also, I did some videos as well. Um, I did a show at 99 Cent Plus, which is a gallery in New York, and it was only videos. So I, I here you can see one of them of Robert De Niro. Um, and in that video, he is just laughing. So he's just sitting there in front of this strange stable, just laughing, doing the De Niro laugh, the Scarface laugh, I guess it would be. And then you can see the scale shifts there as well. Now, is the photo on the left that we're seeing, is that a mirrored reflection? Yes, exactly. Okay. Nice. Yes, because I wanted to Very sort nice of, um, yes, and make you sort of think about Mirror Mirror on the Wall, who's the fairest of them all, even though she's not the evil queen. Mm -hmm. um, and then exactly, and then pairing it with the Elvis and Tina Turner. Um who are looking at themselves right so it's like about reflections and yeah 
and light and how the camera works as a reflective device. But again, it's not truthful. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It seems truthful and we think it's truthful, but it's not. Right. So, and then uh, Know Me for the First Time. This is another book you've done. Yes. Yes. Know Me for the First Time was my first big um, gallery show. And so I work very slowly. It takes me a really long time to complete bodies of work. And I tend to keep working on them. Um, so you I'll also teach and you have a family. So yes, yes, yeah. I do. Yep. And mm -hmm. teach, but also teaching fuels your work. You've talked about that before too. It does. And, you know, when I left teaching in 2018, I thought that I was done and I missed my students so much. I, I love them. I just, I, you know, being an educator and mother are both very important facets of my practice. Mm -hmm. Um, because it, you know, it's that human, human connection. I always say I'm a humanist maximalist. <laughs> like I just, I love color and, and over the top, bright, sparkling compositions, luminosity, but I, you know, the human connection is what really underlies it. Um, so this body of work, Know Me for the First Time is an autobiographical piece. Um, and it's this sort of fictionalized work about, this is really where I started getting into that that idea of post-documentary. So what is true? What is true about your the story of your life? And I sort of was thinking about it as an autobiography, but through pictures. Um, and sort of thinking again about the juxtaposing these very symbolic works. So like, for example, here you have the sunflower that's like, it's giant, it's 40 by 40. Um, so it's like this monstrous scale. Um, and it's sort of like this portrait, right? It's like this sad flower, but it's also so beautiful in its death and sort of like this trope of the flower, the dying flower is so over the top, right? So like embracing these really over the top symbols, like I did with the impersonators. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's sort of done in a different way here. So, and then juxtaposing it with the smaller scale girls, um, so like the three girls reaching up to the three smaller girls, um, where, you know, that photo is, was literally just like a documentary photo, essentially. It's a, I just found it as I was walking. Um, and so sort of aren't your kid, those, none of your kids or no. you were just out walking. Oh, nice. They were actually friends of people that I was with. Um, but it was, it's not staged at all. They were just like playing. And sort of thinking about formal juxtapositions, like reaching, looking, um, and reaching and looking as metaphors for connection, um, metaphors for connection with each other, with pictures, um, and also like this sort of meta idea of how we read images again, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, like this, I always go back to this sort of like truth of photos because it's such a tricky part of the medium. Right. It's, it's one of the reasons that photography isn't taken as seriously often, um, because it has the appearance of sort of being easy. Um, you know, but it thinking about composition, color, juxtaposition of image scale, um, and how we read those works together is always something I think about a lot, obsessively all the time. <laughs> well, also with distortion, just with the man in the hot tub on the phone, I love that his arm is up above, but what's down below is his foot. It's, yes. It's like this weird juxtaposition that kind of yes. throws, throws, thro throws the proportion off. That exactly. Makes it interesting. It doesn't feel like it's wrong. It just feels like it's like, why? <laughs> How is that working? Exactly. It always made that picture always makes me think. So my my senior yearbook quote, <laughs> this was so art girl of me. It was <laughs> Francis Bacon. There is no exquisite beauty without some strangeness in proportion. Nice. I you know I stand by it. I agree. So I always look for the surreal or this the odd. Um, or, or sort of like the awkward, mm -hmm. um, 
Cause to me, that's where the real beauty lies. Like it can't be, it can be beautiful, but it has to have something a little off or strange or surreal about it. Yeah. <laughs> and who's this? This is, her name's Aspen. Mm -hmm. um, she's a friend of my family and she, um, she was just in this sort of wild forest and it was the most magical moment. And to me, it's like, what works about this photo is the, her face, of course, cause she's this amazing face, but also the way that the light hits her face. And then you also see her light yellow shirt, which is so specific. Like it has this specificity to it that I think for me makes the photo with the shorts, right? Mm -hmm. Like sort of like Madras plaid shorts and then like the pocket that's turned out. It turned out, yeah, it's great. So it's like the accidents are what also make it. So it's not too perfect. It has something, you know, like it has this beauty that sucks you in, but then there's something imperfect that takes you out as well. Um, I'm also always really interested in narrative and the way that narrative operates. Um, I find that writers tend to like my work and I think it's because they're sort of these loose narratives that are available, uh, that are incomplete, right? So mm -hmm. you, there is a narrative, but you, the viewer has to fill it in. Have you ever done a project where you've worked with a writer? No, but I've always wanted to. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I have some ideas of who. But someday, someday I will. Um, so, you know, like this, for example, this is my sister. This is a photograph of my sister on the wall um, with Jack. And this, but it's, it's, it's more than a dog and my sister with this beautiful view. It's sort of, they become one creature, um, mm -hmm. new creature, the sort of like mythological, strange, transformed creature. Um, and then also I, I think a lot about optics as well. Mm -hmm. So for example, the way that your eye focuses on her and then the background and sort of moves back and between them. So like front, back, front, back, and sort of the way that the optics um, function there is always fascinating to me as well. Because of course you look in this picture, for example, you look at her, I think you look at like her nipple, her eye her and then the dog and you sort of mm -hmm. go between them like that triangle and then you go in the back and forward and right. sort of the way that your eyes move around the picture um is is also something I think about a lot well and just the the textures too the smoothness of the skin against the rough of the the rock and then the rough of the fur as well it's really yeah weird. I think when pictures work well I think that it's because camera optics are, are all coming together to create magic, mm -hmm. right? So the specificity of the way that the, her skin is luminous and the fur is, is lit and the texture of the wall. And then in this case, co the colors too, right? Like it, it just meshes, but it's, it's so tricky to do. Yeah. Now, when you said earlier, you've been photographing her for 30 years, has it always been kind of in this stylized way or? Um, so this is actually my other sister. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> sister. Good deal. I, I've been photographing both of them though for a really long time. I have two. <laughs> That's so um, nice that they're willing to be your model. <laughs> I know. I'm so lucky. I'm really lucky. Um, no, I photographed them both in very different ways. So I've done like black and white 35 millimeter snapshots. And I've done more, you know, like staged formal portraiture um, and everything in between. Nice. And so the book will have all of those. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So yes. here's a, here's a larger version of the photograph that we saw that of the girls. Here juxtaposed with um, the baby bird. Mm -hmm. um, which again, you know, like color is so important and the sort of like, <clears throat> almost like surreal, like I don't, I saw it with my own eye, but I can't even believe that the, that yellow and the blue was real. Mm -hmm. You know, it seemed, people ask me a lot if I Photoshop, I don't Photoshop anything. I just find the world is surreal. Mm -hmm.
Well, and this juxtaposition is so nice for a lot of reasons, but I love the blue egg with the blue shirt in the middle of the, the girl on the top. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, a snowy owl. And I was sort of interested in, um, you know, like obviously the beauty of the animal and the symbolic importance of owls, you know, like the way that they stand in for wisdom or um, I guess wisdom primarily. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just so spooky and surreal. Um, but also I, I love the way that it's the owls turned and sort of having it as a landscape instead mm -hmm. of a portrait. Um, and sort of like this, it's almost like, I was thinking for this picture about it almost as like a fashion image in a way. Yeah, it has that almost like a model in a cloak turning. Yes, yes, exactly. There's another juxtaposition um, of the octopus with the large scale, the tree from above. Um, so thinking again about juxtaposition and scale and color and sort of that surreal um, way that we read the works together individually as well but mm -hmm. together. So is this another found? Yes, image? yes. <laughs> they almost all are found. Um, and people ask me like, how do you find, I, I take so many pictures. I take ter so many terrible ones. <laughs> so because is that the kind of thing where you always have a camera with you or yes. you go out specifically to shoot and find things that day or I always have a camera with me and I take so many pictures I, I take so many pictures and then don't even necessarily use them right away you know like I'll I'll look back through what I've made from years ago so mm -hmm. when I have a show for example I'll look, look at my archive. I, my practice is essentially one of archive building where I'm just constantly making work. Mm -hmm. And then I use um, the images from my own archive at different times. So I don't have a very strict process in terms of like, I make this work then and I use it for this. I guess sometimes I do for more discrete projects, um, mm -hmm. but not always. Not for the more longer term works. Right. So like this one, you know, these pictures were taken years apart. Well, not that many years apart, I guess, two years, maybe two years apart. But, you know, thinking about the the gesture, the gesture of the two, and then also the blindness, right? So like mm -hmm. the owl is a blind owl and you can kind of see that their eyes are fogged over and cloudy. And then the girl has, has the hair in her face. So, you know, like when I pair images thinking about the way that they work together on multiple levels. And then I, I love to do a scale shift as well, often. So are you saying then you build this archive and then if you work on a project, you can mine it, but then um, for this kind of face, that was more directed, right? You were collecting certain photographs. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So this, this kind of face, the wrestlers, this kind of face, and then the, um, she tells all about witches, which is another mm -hmm. project that will come to momentarily, um, for those works, they were more specific, right? So shot right. over a more specific time period. Um, but a lot of my work, like for this kind of, um, for know me for the first time or Crow's Field, which is another of the projects we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. And for Sister Moon, my book, they're sort of longer term. Right. So I, have, I kind of have both ways of working. Um, or, you know, if I do like editorial work for a magazine, that's like a more specific project, right? right? Yeah. Um, that's an assignment. Yes, exactly. It's like, a, it's a different, and I really enjoy doing that actually, because it forces me to finish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> deadlines. Yes. yes. Big motivators. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? What part of the world are we in? This is in Vermont and this is my sister's house. So the title is sister's house. So I wanted it to sort of be known that it's her house. 
And you spend summers there, right? I do. I do. Yeah. I spend the summer always on the East coast and I tend to photograph there a lot. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily, you know, I think place is quite important in this work. Um, but it's sort of an imaginary place. It's not mm-hmm. necessarily, again, like going back to that idea of truth, right. um, it's sort of an imaginary truth, right? Yeah. There isn't a specificity to the locale that seems, which it lends to it being more universal, which is nice. That's my hope. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. I sort of want it to be this imaginary place where the viewer can project their own fantasies and ideas and and also project their own meanings as mm-hmm. well. Are these your kids? So the one on the left is my brother. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who's qu- quite adorable. And uh, I'm lucky because I have, I have cute siblings. <laughs> 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 um, the one on the right was a girl that I, um, and I was in Maine and I, I had been photographing these teenagers in Maine. Um, it was a project that I never really, it was never really resolved, but I used a few images from it. So the, she's from that, that project. Um, she was just sitting in the, in the long grass and it was sort of became this like, dreamy flat image right where it's just like the the texture of the grass and the hair are what Mm -hmm. you look at um this is an installation view from my show she tells all um about witches um so i wanted to investigate i i do tend to um I do these longer term projects about, about that are very personal about my family, but then I also do a lot of these different projects about subgroups, right? So the, the wrestlers, the impersonators, and then here's a project I did about witches. Um, I'm very interested in uh, magic um, mm-hmm. and sort of new age spiritual practices. I grew up in a new age religion. Um, and so it's sort of like familiar to me, but it's mm-hmm. also really fascinating to think about again what I'm photographing is actually not visible so like like people who are psychic or have um different sorts of like gifts of that realm you can't see it what they do so I was interested in see in um visualizing the performance of these roles so the how people perform the role excuse me, the role of a psychic or, um, different, uh, spiritual practices, right? So like channeling spirits or, um, doing tarot readings, for example. Um, so this and is all another of, uh, installation all of these, view. Um, um, local people that you were able to connect with? Yes. So oh, all Southern California. Yeah. So all of the people are from Southern California. Yes. Yes, exactly. So the, this project was very specific. It was very, um, it, you know, it was like, I had to do it within a very short amount of time. And I found the people, photographed them, put it together and did it, which was great. It was, an, it was nice they, to have a very specific Was it a time collaboration <laughs> of being in their environment and Did yeah. They, so, it, some, was so it a for example, this, of poses because it's it's you know because some of them feel a little more posed, some of them feel like you're capturing them in the moment. Yes, exactly. So I kind of um, had a similar approach to the impersonators. So depending on the person um, and their sort of sense of self presentation. Uh, I worked with what they how what they wanted to do. So it was a, it was a bit of a collaboration. Um, So some of them were more posed, right? And then some of them, like, for example, the house is not posed, obviously. So I interspersed the more posed portraits with um, sort of more dreamy landscapes and objects to create this overall um, work about female power, really. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's Amanda Gates Garcia looking out of her window. 
Um, you know, like she, for example, has such a strong uh, sense of self and such an amazing presence. Right. She was so fun to photograph. I bet. She was very easy. She's like, she's like stunning, but also really fun to photograph. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is Camille. So she, um, she wanted to do a ritual on the LA river. And so she had this very specific idea about how she wanted to, um, perform it. So I just, you know, I worked within that context. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, you know, I, I like to honor their ideas as well. So it really is an, a collaboration, although the final project is of course, um, edited yeah. by me. Yeah. 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 This is Faye. She's a tarot reader. She, I think, is actually the most accurate. Everything she told me came true. Wow. So I should say I got readings from everyone. <laughs> so you she, everything you said experienced came true. their process. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. And I'm I'm sort of an agnostic. I believe in um, energies, but I I don't necessarily. And I believe that everyone I photographed is sincere in what they're mm -hmm. doing. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I do believe in energies because yeah. people always ask me like, what do you, what do you believe? Yeah. And there's different ways of accessing knowledge and there's things we can't explain. So. Exactly. Yeah. And I sort of like the idea of photography is light and, and magic is also light or I I'm using the words witchcraft, magic, and various and sort of new age spiritual practices interchangeably. Um, because I respect them all, you know, like mm -hmm. there's, there's all sorts of different approaches. Like this is H Jesus. He's a curandero. Um, he has a shop on Santa Monica. Um, so yeah, they're all, they're all local, you know, and, and he sort of like utilizes different practices. So like you see the Buddhas in the, in the window mm -hmm. in front of him. Right. Um, lots of different areas. Yes. And there's Patty. She's sort of more of like a Hollywood witch, like very much in like the Hollywood witch tradition, like self-described. Right. And so it's very much about her presentation. Like she had a very specific way she wanted to, um, to dress and pose herself. And I, I love to photograph someone like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it just depends. It depends on the people. And I, I like to, I think to me, it's not as interesting to have, I, I respect this approach of, of doing the same thing over and over and over and repeating it, but I just, I don't work that way. Right. I'm a bit more chaotic, chaotic and maximalist. Yeah. <laughs> you find your flow and you follow it. Well, and especially if you're leaving some of it up to chance of finding finding images that you're going to photograph. Chance and serendipity is always such mm -hmm. an important part of the process. And it always works out. <laughs> That's a nice juxtaposition. I was just thinking that as we've been going through, I, I keep thinking, oh, I actually, because, you know, sometimes as an artist, you doubt yourself a bit. You're like, I don't really know what I'm doing. But as I was looking through some of these, some of the pairings are good. So was <laughs> like, there a book of this body of work? No, mm -hmm. but, but I think those might, might be in my book that's coming out this summer. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Is that Amanda again? Yes. Yeah. Amanda with an albino peacock. And here's the house we saw earlier. This house, that picture was so, so this is a nerdy photography thing. When <laughs> I took this picture, the yellow and the orange were not in, it didn't look like that. It was just regular tungsten light like indoor light oh really? and then when I got the film yes when I got the film back it was those colors and it's because of the light temperature and you're shooting still all in film I you? am yeah um, I am but I did get a medium format digital camera so do you do you 
do you do your own printing? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. The color and the print, I, I have a giant printer right here. The color is so important to me. You know, it's like in real life, my prints are, I work tirelessly on them. You know, they have to have the most perfect balance um, because mm -hmm. it, it, that's all I have, right. Is the print right. quality in the end. So, you know, like I take my work, you, I capture it digitally I ca or I capture it on film, but most, mostly film, but I am mm -hmm. trying to switch to medium format digital. Um, but you know, the, the print itself is the work, right? right? So working on my prints is just, I, I do it obsessively and they have to be perfect and the color matters deeply. So you really are kind of, you're creating an object. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I would consider myself to be an object maker for sure. Yes. So here's the book. Yes. So these are just screenshots of the edit. So this is the messy process that is happening right now. Um, so you can kind of see, so this is my sister with her baby. Um, and then, yeah. So the little black and white ones, I think will move as you page through, they're going to move on the other opposite page. Oh, nice. Yeah. So there'll be juxtapositions with like strange, surreal, natural scenes. For example, like the purple mushroom that I just found like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I included here, this is by no means the, the order that the work will appear in, but just to show you that this is the same person. So, oh, interesting. yeah. So that's my sister, Simran, and that's her again. Um, so there's like a button that's her again at different ages. And there she is again. So there she is at her wedding. And there she is when she's around 13 or maybe, maybe 12. I know when we had talked before, I brought up the Brown sisters where that was just one photograph a year of the four sisters and. Yes. Yes. That's definitely an influence. You know, the way that, um, time is depicted in photographs, a long period of time. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. that's like such an amazing example. Um, I didn't do these obviously in the same, using the same camera or the same backdrop or the same composition. The same, yeah. Um, you know, that sort of repetition of the similarity is what I think makes that work. So, well, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why the Brown sisters is such an amazing project. Um, but this work, you know, seeing that it's the same person or realizing it, I, I'm hoping that it will kind of creep up on you in a way and just be so strange and sort of um, pointing to the, the, the intensity that is the passage of time. Right. And also sort of like the passage of time and, and how love progresses, like how love, like we love people in our lives and how that changes or stays the same over time. Yeah. We did have a question come in um, that oh, I'm just going to read the whole chat message. So it says, Siri, I always find your work to be as, as you put it, to put it magical. And like alchemists, this magic seems to cut across many narratives. You talked about this too, and about how you often archive dive to construct these imagined truths, but is there some kind of meta narrative that is common to all of your various bodies of work? A life motif Ooh, you could talk about. That is such a good question. Of course. Yeah. Um, wow. That is an, an excellent question. You know, I would, I would go back to that it's about love, you know, like my work is about love and human connection. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, as I, I said in the beginning, I, it's about how to connect with others and how to understand people's experiences. And there's no real way to do that because we're all stuck in our own sort of like meat puppet shells, mm -hmm. but this is my attempt at trying. So I, I think that's my sort of meta narrative is sort of a this attempt to connect with my sisters, with random people I find, with nature um, mm -hmm. and sort of the beauty, it, making sense of the sort of be tragic, beautiful world that we live in. 
um, which is like a bit, perhaps a bit chaotic of a, a summary, but I stand by it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's excellent motivation. Um, this well, is because also, I think you're uncovering that everything through that process, that everything is connected and you're revealing kind of the cycles. Yeah. It's about the cycles of life. Mm -hmm. I think the cycles of, of intimate relationships, the cycles of nature, um, mm -hmm. the cycles of familiarity and loneliness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even just, even the relationship just to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think the people that you're putting out there are definitely revealing themselves to us and where they are at that particular time. Um, we also have um, your uh, Jennifer has said series work holds such magic of both the familiar and the familiar and the universal. She's interested in hearing more about your book process and editing. Ooh, good question from Jennifer as well. Um, yeah, I uh, the 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 book process is very challenging. It's very chaotic and painful to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I feel like every, I don't know, I think that if I was writing words, every sentence would be like this, like you pulling it out of you, but sort of, I, I think that I start with the main portraits and then, um, the rest of the book is our works that support the portraits. So sort of about the cycle of life like for example, the mushroom or um, like other sort of magical natural images. Mm -hmm. um, do, you work, do you work with an editor? Do you have other people look at you and give you feedback? Yes, yes I do. <laughs> yes. And it's always a sort of push pull, right? Fight slash fight. <laughs> Making you justify your decisions. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So these black and whites we've been looking at. So I included these at the end because they are, um, they're Polaroids of the wrestlers that I took and I am doing another little book project with these. So oh, nice. TBD, um, I just thought I would sort of tease them. Um, so, so it'll just be the Polaroids then? Yes. Nice. It'll just be Polaroids. Yeah. Um, so I have um, an archive of about 200 wrestler Polaroids. That'll be nice and, to mine that and read yeah. all that material. And this is something recent. You just had this amazing experience. Yes. I actually saw that one of the lovely people that was with me, Yole, is here. Hi, Yole. Um, so I was lucky enough to go on the Arctic Circle residency. Um, <laughs> hi, Yole. Yeah, wonderful. Keep going. Um, so I photographed in, I was lucky enough to go around Svalbard, mm -hmm. uh, which is an archipelago um, north of Norway. And it was an amazing and grueling experience. Um, it was, we were on a boat for two weeks with and no Wi-Fi or energy. residency. Yeah, it's a residency. It's called the Arctic Circle. Okay, there we go. And it was amazing. Um, so yeah, so I'm I'm that's another project that I'm working on, and it's about surreal, majestic beauty. It's about climate change. It's about magic as well. Um, so like for example, here on the left, you have a photograph of a shooting star, um, and the right is a sort of night scene, um, you know, and I, I, the work that I made there, I'm not sure it's completely messy in process and unresolved, but I just wanted to show it because I, I love seeing people's mess. They're unresolved Another in progress. <laughs> so I thought, you know, here's my mess. We would love, yeah, it's a pretty beautiful mess that you have. <laughs> and what an amazing experience. And then you just was, got back from Japan as well. I did. I did. It's been, I've basically circumnavigated the globe <laughs> in the past month. 
I don't know what time it is. I don't know where I am. I I think it's 4 a.m. in Tokyo for me. I, well, you know, but I'm happy to be here. We're at time. It goes by so fast. And I just really appreciate you being with wow. us, especially after all your travel. And um, it was really enlightening to learn more about your work. And we just really appreciate you being here with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And we will we'll be back in the new year. I hope everybody has a fantastic holiday. And, um, you know, that uh, all your wishes come true. <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Take care, everybody. Bye. Take care, Thanks Siri. for coming. Thanks again.